coming up on Lawmakers. More details of the governor's education plan are explained. Motorcyclists rally at the Capitol in support of their legislative agenda. And Governor Purdue unveils the new uniform for Georgia's arena football team. Those stories and more are coming up next. Live from Atlanta, this is Lawmakers for Tuesday, January 27th. Here are your hosts, Gerald Bryant and Nwandi Lawson. Good evening, everyone. Also on tonight's broadcast, an interview with Marsha Moore, the new head of the Bright from the Start program. And the House encourages businesses to give paid leave to parents who volunteer at their children's school. But our top story tonight, more details about GeorgiaLearns.com. Governor's Education Advisor today outlined three bills that make up Governor Sonny Perdue's GeorgiaLearns.com education initiative. The measures include educational proposals for the state's youngest citizens from birth all the way through high school. In his State of the State address, Governor Perdue announced that infants and preschoolers could benefit from a reorganized Office of School Readiness, which would include the pre-K program and Smart Start. The agency would also replace the Department of Human Resources as the licensing agency for daycare centers and provide them with educational information. GeorgiaLearns.com will make it clear to disruptive students once and for all that teachers are in charge of the classroom. Senate Bill 428 uses the privilege of driving to discourage truancy and discipline problems. Students with 10 or more unexcused absences or 10 or more days suspension could have their licenses revoked until they're 18 or have improved attendance. Parents will be notified about truancy when their child has five or more unexcused absences in a semester with the possible penalties of $25 to $100 in fines and or short jail terms or community service for the parents of truant students. Additionally, the bill seeks to move the state from 46th in graduation rates by suspending driver's licenses of dropouts. GeorgiaLearns.com promotes accountability by giving local schools and school systems the flexibility they need to reach the high standards that we expect of them. Governor Purdue again this session offers a measure to allow districts to use system averages to determine class sizes as well as how much money each school will be allocated and how to administer remedial and early intervention programs. This proposal was one of the sticking points when the bill landed in the House Education Committee last year. I'm not prepared to give any greater accountability to these local systems who we don't know are doing their job. Senate Bill 429 also changes the way schools are rated from a letter grade to a percentage. If a school performs below an acceptable level for two consecutive years, the State Board of Education would have the authority to intervene and establish guidelines for improvement. Similar measures have been introduced in the House. The Senate Education Committee will consider SB 428 and 429 tomorrow morning. The Early Childhood Education Bill will be introduced on Thursday. And as part of Governor Sonny Perdue's 2004 education initiatives, the Office of School Readiness may undergo a few changes. Lawmakers Chrissy Thrasher is here to tell us more about those changes. Chrissy. Well, Gerald, the Office of School Readiness may soon be called, right from the start, Georgia's Office of Early Care and Education. And with the new name would come new improvements to the program. bright start to school success. And if the governor's proposed legislation passes, the current Office of School Readiness would become bright from the start, Georgia's Office of Early Child Care and Education. And that's the focus of this agency, is to make sure each child is given the opportunity to be able to develop as best as that child can before they start kindergarten. Marsha Moore is the director of the Office of School Readiness and says the governor's proposed bright from the start program would strengthen existing early child care and education programs in Georgia, including pre-K and Smart Start. I think the governor realized that there are some very good programs in the state, but the programs do not, I mean, they're not coordinated completely, and that he wants to streamline those systems. That way we can bring the talents of all these people who are working to do the same thing for our children. We'll bring them all together, and we can also bring our funding streams together as well and get more bang for the buck for our children and our families. Director Moore says she looks forward to implementing the changes Bright from the Start will bring if the legislation passes. Well, I think to have this, the opportunity to bring these agencies together and to streamline this organization so we can truly bring better services to our children in an effort, all of us together, I think is tremendous. And I think it gives a great opportunity to grow an, an, an organization that truly brings the best services to our children and our families. 
So it's a starting point. It's a starting point to say that yes, children zero to five do need to be educated and they do need good care. And those two things are not mutually exclusive. Children need to be nurtured and children need to have opportunity to learn and grow and express themselves to truly be ready for school. And Director Morris says she appreciates the governor's efforts to continue to improve the education of Georgia's children. The Bright from the Start legislation has not yet been introduced this session. Reporting live, I'm Chrissy Thrasher for Lawmakers. Thank you very much, Chrissy. The Georgia House today passed a Parental Leave Act allowing parents to get paid leave to volunteer at schools. But House Bill 1058 ended up being what's called permissive legislation. It was amended to say that employers may give leave time, not that they shall give leave time. Here's the bill's sponsor, Representative Roger Bruce. This bill was conceived by students from A. Philip Randolph Elementary School. All of them are 10 years old and they saw the need to invite parents and make sure that parents participated in their education. And I applaud these students uh, for their efforts to participate in the process, and we hope that they have, have set an example that their parents will follow. And uh, we ask that you uh, favorably support this bill, uh, and that it is good for our schools, it's good for our children, and it's good for the state of Georgia. House Bill 1058 passed 158 to 6 with the amendment that allows but doesn't require employers to give paid leave to parents volunteering at schools. Governor Sonny Perdue spoke to some of his hometown leaders today in the annual Houston County Chamber Legislative Luncheon. They hold this event every year to talk about some of the main issues and concerns for middle Georgia, that middle Georgia county. David Zelsky joins us live from the Capitol with more on that story. David. Well, thanks, Gerald. You know, the main concern this year for business leaders in that area is the threat of the Pentagon closing Robbins Air Force Base come 2005. The base employs a very high percentage of people in Houston County who don't want to see their base closed or diminished. In going to the uh, Pentagon and talking to all the chiefs, uh, we've made good relationships up there and we're working hard. What we told them is, and certainly stems from middle Georgia's standpoint as you all very well know, is that Georgia is, is, a, is a patriotic and always has been a patriotic state. We've always done more than our share and we're continued willing to be, do more than our share. Uh, if the, if the Congress affirms uh, that we will uh, do away with 25% of installations, uh, folks, I think that may be, could be a net gain for Georgia, frankly. Not to say that no facility in the state will be closed. We can't say that assuredly. But I think if uh, there will be missions that up at those other 25% of installations that we think we're going to be out. And we were going in a proactive fashion looking to grow the mission and looking to grow the capability. One of the things the Pentagon looks at is the community spirit and the response of what we do in the area. Georgia's First Lady Mary Perdue then took a moment to share a few of her own initiatives, followed by the Lieutenant Governor's appreciation for the direction that part of the state is headed. We had a summit in late August uh, that launched what I'm calling the Our Children Campaign. And instead of expanding my focus, I'm actually narrowing my focus. Everywhere I go, if they want me to come and speak, I'm going to talk about these children because these are the children in Georgia that have been in the past so easily overlooked and forgotten about. I can assure you that as Georgia drives down I-75 and they see what has occurred in Houston County, they see those two new interstate exits, they see the Agri Center, they know Warner Robins is there. Uh, they know about the Museum of Aviation. They know of your support for your technical college and for Macon State College. They see a community that's on the move and on the grow, and that doesn't just happen by accident. Also attending the luncheon were Secretary of State Kathy Cox, Attorney General Thurber Baker, and Georgia's Agriculture Commissioner Tommy Irvin. Reporting live, I'm David Zelsky for Lawmakers. Thanks, David. The Senate today was scheduled to vote on reconsidering its decision to put two tort reform bills in the Judiciary Committee. There's an ongoing dispute over the bills that attempt to revise Georgia's medical liability laws. The vote to reconsider yesterday's action never came. Opponents of having the bills taken out of other committees and reassigned to Judiciary say their fight isn't over. 
Meanwhile, the state Senate has already passed two resolutions proposing state constitutional amendments. One protects Georgia's tradition of hunting and fishing. The other clears the way for faith-based organizations to provide social services for the state. The Defense of Marriage Act is waiting in the Senate wings. Today, I talked with Senate Minority Whip about the three Republican resolutions. For people who didn't already know it, I think these amendments make it very clear that this is an election year. And I think people are trying to position themselves, thinking about the elections in the fall. Fortunately, I don't think that the Democratic Party is going to be deterred by this. Uh, a number of our more conservative members um, are expected to be trapped with this kind of legislation. We're too smart for that. Uh, Democrats have been consistently conservative in this state for years, and we will continue to be so. And I think clearing up our ballots with these amendments is not going to do anything that will serve the people of Georgia, nor will it deter us from regaining our majority in the Senate. The uh, minority leader, uh, Mr. Meyer von Bremen, mentioned, I think, when the first one of these came up, he called them report card issues. Is that how the Democratic Party sees them, as, a, as an effort to force votes on, on what might be considered populist issues? It's very clear that these are issues that will be used as scorecard issues in the campaign. Uh, fortunately, we have responsible people in our party who recognize that we should not get out of line with the people of Georgia. We're going to be consistent with what our constituents want us to be. And that's why we're going to focus more on those issues that will more directly impact our lives, the Hope Scholarship, those kinds of issues. In the area where I live, we have some 2,100 people who are losing their jobs, some say with some di di indirect uh, impact from the tax increase that was supported by the other party. Um, a lot of tobacco workers are losing their jobs. I doubt very seriously they're going to sit around the table and say, oh, gee, we need a Defense of Marriage Act uh, to help us with our paying of bills for our children to pay our college tuition. Those kinds of issues, I think, are what really will have elections turning, as well as what we really should be focused on in this state. You mentioned the Hope Scholarship, and I think everyone agrees that uh, some measures need to be taken in order to ensure that Hope will survive through the years. There's a difference of opinion in uh, what tack to take on that. What is your take on what needs to be done to preserve Hope Scholarship? First, let's look at some of the things that that do not need to be done. One is we do not need to use the SAT as a criteria for uh, establishing the baseline for hope, uh, nor do we need to um, eliminate the paying for books. Uh, I think that's important when you consider uh, that a number of our young people who receive the HOPE scholarship uh, otherwise would not be able to go to college. They would not have the financial resources to do that and to take away the uh, provision of books would be a real serious, serious detriment to a number of those uh, HOPE scholars. We need to look at ways that will preserve it. I think the Lieutenant Governor's proposal to have a freeze on tuition is a very good one. We need to look at those kinds of things that we can do that will not have a negative impact on access to HOPE uh, for so many of our young people in this state who benefited from it. There seem to be some areas of agreement across the aisles. One is ethics reform. The Senate passed an ethics package last year that never got through the House. What do you see happening in ethics reform in the Senate this year? Again, um, we passed, I think, a very strong ethics bill last session. We're going to continue to advocate for that. I believe that there are some of our House colleagues will now relook at this issue and come forward with uh, an acceptable ethics bill that will do some real ethics reform for this state. It's important for us to, to do this as senators and representatives to continue to build and hold the confidence of the people of Georgia, and I feel very confident that we're going to do that. And that will have to be the last word. Senator Robert Brown, thanks for joining us on Lawmakers. We look forward to keeping up with you throughout the session on these issues. Penalties could get tougher for those who don't observe traffic laws. A bill sponsored by Representative Alan Powell would increase the punishment for those who cause severe bodily harm to others by failing to yield the right of way. Lawmakers Jesse Freeman has the story. Jesse. Thanks, and Wandy. The current minimum fine for harming a pedestrian during a right of way infraction is only $25. Representative Alan Powell says that does not send the right message. He is sponsoring House Bill 1155 that would increase the minimum fine to $250. He presented the bill to the House Motor Vehicles Committee today and explained his motivation. Where this comes from is that there have been uh, numerous cases of serious injury 
which basically resulted in a $25 fine. And to be quite honest, this seems to be, truthfully, this seems to be an insult to those people who have been seriously injured. And, you know, the reason that we passed these, uh, these different <coughs> codes of law is that these are basically uh, those instructions that we send to the rest of our society of a code of conduct and how they need to, you know, and in the driving statutes especially, these penalties directly affect them and once they know, and hopefully that corrects uh, certain blind spots in behavior. The committee did show support for the bill, but decided there was some language that needed clarification, including designating such incidents as unintentional. Powell conceded as much and said he wanted to do something he has rarely done in his legislative career, asked that his own legislation be put on hold. Committee Chairman Bobby Parham reassigned the bill to subcommittee. Reporting live, I'm Jesse Freeman for Lawmakers. Thank you, Jesse. Well, the lawmakers' program may have been off Friday, but Governor Purdue was busy. The governor swore in a quartet of new state leaders. I, Gail Buckner, solemnly swear, solemnly swear that I will faithfully execute my duties. That I will faithfully execute my duties. Gail Buckner was sworn in as the executive director of the Criminal Justice Coordinating Committee. Garland Hunt is the newest member of the State Board of Pardons and Paroles. Bill Hudson took the oath of office as he became the executive director of the Peace Officers Standards and Training Council. The new executive director of the Office of Child Advocate is Dee Sims. And Albert Murray was sworn in as the commissioner of the Department of Juvenile Justice. But of this 478,000, there are about 5%, 4.8 to be exact, are young people whose futures are much more uncertain and unpredictable. These are the young people who are at great risk of becoming offenders and becoming clients of the Department of Juvenile Justice and perhaps clients of the Department of Correction if there is not some intervention. So I'm here today to provide a service for this group of young people. It's important that these young people are not forgotten. Despite their criminal behavior and their delinquent ways, they're young people who represent the future of this state. They cannot and they should not be written off. Now, yesterday, the House agreed to amend the law allowing public schools to receive electronic versions of textbooks. Representative Virgil Flood said the revisions would strengthen the measure. Two years ago, this body passed a bill that allowed for books that were published uh, also be available in an electronic version. What this bill simply does is to address a slight oversight in that bill and aligns the legislative intent with um, the statute. Essentially what we've done is to request that textbook publishers provide an accurate and complete version, not just a facsimile thereof. And so we've tightened the requirements uh, significantly so that the electronic version matches up much more clearly with the text version. Um, and it also, the other thing this does is it allows the local school district to determine whether the school district will pay for that electronic version or if they can pass that cost along to the students and, and or parents. The Georgia chapter of the National Federation of the Blind says the bill is essential for blind students. The House passed the committee substitute to House Bill 363 with one floor amendment. The vote was 171 to 0. The Department of Community Health Commissioner told the House Appropriations Committee today that 05 budget cuts mean his department will have to limit eligibility, utilization, the scope of benefits, and prices paid to providers. Representative Michelle Henson asked Tim Burgess whether the Indigent Care Trust Fund could make up the shortfalls. When the hospitals are picking up the cost, doesn't that ultimately go into the indigent, indigent monies that we give to the hospitals? and the dish payments and all of that, won't we ultimately be picking that up? Uh, to an extent. What happens is the Energy Care Trust Fund um, is a mechanism to attempt to cover some portion of the uncompensated care that hospitals experience. It's a con and it, but it doesn't involve any monies from the state. It's a combination of contributions from those hospitals themselves that's then matched with the federal dollars and then returned to them in a, in a payment to, to offset a portion of their uncompensated care. While hospitals may provide more care than the state can afford to pay for, Commissioner Burgess said the news is better for nursing homes thanks to a trust fund. Nursing homes, just like every other provider, is experiencing fiscal pressures uh, that challenge their ability to maintain the level of service at the, at the rates that, that the state pays. Uh, and, and I would say this, at least the nursing homes 
are being held harmless from any reductions in the governor's proposal, unlike the hospitals, um, because of the tax, because of the tax that you mentioned. That bill that, you, that the legislature passed last year allows the tax to be generated by nursing homes uh, that, that keys off their level of revenue that, that nursing homes in total create. Uh, the governor's proposal maximizes that tax and uses the additional dollars that come from the maximization of that tax in 05 to almost offset all of his proposed reduction in state funds. So there's about an $18 million reduction in state funds to the nursing homes in here, but about $16 million of that is replaced with additional tax revenue from this nursing home tax you're talking about. The governor's office has recommended a $100 million cut to the Department of Community Health. The Georgia Association of Latino Elected Officials, or GALEO, wants to give Georgia Latinos a louder voice in the legislative process. The organization held a press conference today to announce their legislative agenda. There's also broader legislation that impacts the Latino community that we'll be taking a look at as well, such as uh, legislation on racial profiling and anti-discrimination law. Galeo will not only work in the legislature, it will also work within the community through initiatives to increase the Latino vote in future elections. We want to do uh, an engaging of the Latino community. Uh, we're doing that in a couple of ways. Uh, one, we're uh, launching the Georgia Latino Vote 2004 with the collaboration of other organizations as well. And uh, we want to double the number of registered Latino voters in the state of Georgia by the presidential election. Secondly, we're doing a Civics 101 seminar where we're uh, training Latino community leaders on how to engage their own voter registration campaigns within their own communities. Galeo is also working with the legislature to voice support for the DREAM Act, a congressional act aimed towards advancing education in the immigrant community. It is a, uh, a bill, a federal bill designed to clarify how young students, uh, both in high school and college, uh, can go to, to school in the United States even though they were, their parents were undocumented and they themselves may not even have, all the, have met all the requirements. The DREAM Act is currently being considered by both houses. Meanwhile, motorcyclists rode to the Capitol today to raise awareness about their legislative agenda. Lawmakers Patrick Baldwin has that story. Today at the Capitol, motorcyclists from all over Georgia rallied to support American bikers active towards education, otherwise known as ABATE. ABATE is a lobbyist group of motorcycle enthusiasts who seek to protect the rights of all bikers within Georgia. Repealing the state helmet law is at the forefront of the group's concerns. Senator Joey Brush, who has supported ABATE for years, spoke today at the rally. ABATE of Georgia speaks for every rider in the state of Georgia. They are your voice and your face in these halls. Senator Brush also discussed an anti-discrimination bill he is sponsoring within the Senate. We've got an anti-discrimination bill that's very important to the riders of this state. We need your support. We need you to talk to your legislators about that. The state director of ABATE, William McNair, discussed his feelings on the helmet and discrimination issues. My position has always been it should be a freedom of choice issue. Uh, so many things are dangerous in your everyday life, but those things are not uh, legislated. You know, we just feel like it should be a freedom of choice issue and not something mandated by the government. Uh, I've been in a number of places before. If you walk in there wearing uh, a shirt or any kind of clothing that depicts motorcycles and names and whatnot, you can't come in there. Uh, places that don't want motorcycles in their parking lots. The House of Representatives has a new bill in front of them affecting motorcyclists as well. The bill calls for harsher punishments for those who fail to yield the right of way to a motorcycle and as a result cause injury or death. Representative Alan Powell spoke today at the rally, lending his support to the group and to the bill he is sponsoring. What I'm actually handling for y'all this year is the uh, right-of-way violation. And it would raise that to a misdemeanor of a high and aggravated nature so that if somebody runs you off the road and up a tree, that it, they just don't get a slap on the hand with a $25 fine. With three bills before the General Assembly, motorcyclists say they will be watching the actions of the legislator very closely. I'm Patrick Baldwin for Lawmakers. Governor Purdue joined two members of the Georgia Force, that's the state's arena football team, as they unveiled their new uniforms. Former University of Georgia head coach Vince Dooley, now chairman of the Georgia Force Advisory Board, was presented with his own jersey number. The governor also received a jersey, but with the number 14, reminiscent of his own days as a quarterback for the Georgia Bulldogs. Everything is committed to the fans to have a wholesome entertainment for family. And I like that, so, and that's why I like being a part of the uh, 
of the Georgia Force, and we appreciate very much. Thank you, you Bruce. Thank you. We're glad. Then I want to do the official thing. Now, this is uh, this is the uh, Purdue uh, uniform, including the shoulder pads, and we are perfectly delighted if you want to pull that jacket off. Uh, Actually, if you have a helmet, it's just in time for the legislature. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's see. Take time to get in there. Right? So, you've done this before, haven't you? All right. Oh, there you go. All right, are you ready? <laughs> the Georgia Force plays their home opener on February 8th, sporting these new uniforms made by Atlanta-based Russell Athletics. All right, it is time to get out a pen and a piece of paper. We're going to have a pop quiz. The subject, state symbols. Number one, what is the official state butterfly? It is, of course, the tiger swallowtail. Number two, the official state fossil is, of course, the shark tooth. Three, name the official state insect. Answer, the honeybee. And four, what is the official state seashell? Everyone knows that one. It is the knobbed whelk. Which brings us to, there is an extra credit question. What does the Georgia House think should be the official state amphibian? It was the idea of a group of fourth grade students at Armurchie Elementary School near Rome. When they were in third grade, they studied in science, um, all the flora and fauna of Georgia. And they realize that we have no state amphibian in Georgia. We have a state fossil, a state gem, state trees, and no state amphibian. When they got into fourth grade, two teachers were team teaching science and social studies, Mrs. Pinson and Mrs. McLean, and the children learned how a bill becomes a law in Georgia. So they worked with the State Department of Natural Resources uh, with experts from the department in designing a bill that would make the green tree frog our state symbol. And this year they are in fifth grade. They are anxiously awaiting passage of this bill. This bill cost nothing and yet it spotlights one of nature's creatures in our state. This frog grows in almost all sections of our state and many school children across Georgia and their teachers are interested in passage of this bill. How could you be against that bill? I'm glad we have a recorded vote on this. Everyone voted? This so the clerk will lock the machine. On the passage of the bill, the ayes are 156, nays are 3. This bill, having received the requisite constitutional majority, is therefore passed. That was Speaker Terry Coleman. So the mighty green tree frog is one hop closer to becoming the official state amphibian. <laughs> and I failed the pop quiz. But lawmakers will not be broadcast tomorrow evening because the Georgia General Assembly is in recess. Lawmakers returns Thursday, January 29th at 7 p.m. Now, for those of you with access to the Internet, you can watch lawmakers online. Visit our website at gpv.org. Lawmakers programs are streamed live and archived on our site every night that we're on the air. Now, stay tuned for an exploration of history. That's BMW on great cars. That program's coming up next year on Georgia Public. Broadcasting. That is our broadcast for this, the seventh legislative day of the Georgia General Assembly. Thanks for joining us. I'm Gerald Bryant. And I'm Wandy Lawson. Good night.